With us in studio today is Rabbi Abraham Cooper of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Rabbi, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, what your mission is. Well, back in 1977, Rabbi Marvin Heyer uh, went to Vienna to uh, have an audience with a man named Simon Wiesenthal, who was uh, known uh, mostly for being the famous Nazi hunter. Right. He was a victim of the Holocaust, and he and his wife lost 89 members of their family. But unlike most other survivors, he never really left the Holocaust. He was the unofficial ambassador of six million murdered Jews and millions of other victims of the Nazis. And he took upon himself the very difficult task of trying to bring the mass murderers before the Bar of Justice. During the Cold War, that was a very, very difficult and thankless task. One that uh, most Jews uh, did not want to embrace uh, either. Mm -hmm. By the time he was finished with his work, he brought to justice over 1,100 of those criminals and had an important role to play also in the Eichmann case, maybe the most uh, important Nazi war criminal who was uh, captured after uh, the Second World War. So Rabbi Harrod goes to him in Vienna and says, Mr. Wiesenthal, King Solomon says, a good name is more precious than oil. We want your good name. Uh, and he said, well, if you want my name, I'm not only worried about old Nazis, I'm worried about what's happening today and tomorrow, protect the Jewish people and human rights. If you're ready to be an activist like me, then I'll give you my name. And that was uh, 33 plus years ago. And that sort of set the stage for our mission. That means uh, the fight uh, against anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. bigotry, uh, against genocide uh, worldwide, which unfortunately today is still a part of uh, civilization, in defense of Israel. But also we're a teaching institution. We're home to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles that's hosted five million uh, people. We have a smaller museum in New York, Raya Films. Mm -hmm. uh, we produce um, documentaries. Uh, one will be coming out on Herzl next year. There's just one on Churchill. Two have won Academy Awards. Uh, so it's a very dynamic place. I'm, my main focus is really on issues of the day, uh, how to impact on uh, difficult issues like anti-Semitism and hate crimes. Is, it, the, is the incidence of hate crimes and anti-Semitism on the rise or the decline worldwide? Well, worldwide you have to say that there is an increase. But I, I would caution, we, we're not an institution that focuses and says, well, if it went up 20%, one year and down 15 the next that you can really extrapolate a great deal. Mm -hmm. the, the, the facts of life are that in big states like uh, Florida and California, you're going to have uh, multiple hundreds of incidents, hate crimes against blacks, uh, usually the number one target for racism, against Jews, mm -hmm. the number one target for religious-based bias. And uh, the real issue is how does society deal with it? Are the police on top of it? Are they properly trained? Are the, is the political establishment going to deal with it? So we have one situation in the States. Look, we had a recent uh, case uh, so far unsolved in um, Montreal, Canada, where four synagogues in a Jewish day school were uh, vandalized uh, in one night. Hmm. Uh, so these uh, incidents uh, will happen and overseas in places like Europe. There are uh, entire communities, sometimes countries, in which, uh, for example, uh, Jews are urged, don't wear a kippah in public, don't dangle the Star of David around your neck. Uh, you I know, understand you recently returned from a trip to Sweden, where um, the politicians were putting a blind face towards uh, some of the incidents of racism and anti-Semitism occurred. The third largest city in Sweden is called Malmo and there are about 750 Jews left, including a Chabad rabbi, and about 70,000 Muslims. And there, the political establishment, including the mayor, the police, the prosecutors, have basically let the Jews twist in the wind. And so we went to inform the Justice Minister of Sweden that the Wiesenthal Center was putting a travel advisory on the city. What that means is that if you don't have a real good reason to go, you may want to think twice. And if you do go, you have to take into account the experiences of a local rabbi who went 30 times to the police and there's never been an investigation, not a single arrest, prosecution. So that's why, to your question, like, how bad is it and how are the numbers? The numbers are up, but you have to take many different factors into account. And especially 
what the authorities do the morning after such incidents. You have to give high grades in the United States and I think generally speaking in Canada. Uh, it's much more problematic and complex once you get uh, to Europe and we haven't even touched a place like Iran where you have state-sponsored mm -hmm. anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, uh, and all the rest. And uh, unfortunately, the, the hatred, uh, not just for the state of Israel, but for Jews that's manifested by Al-Qaeda, by many, unfortunately, mainstream figures in the Arab uh, media, and unfortunately, even in the Muslim world, worldwide, uh, places far, far removed uh, from the conflict in the Holy Land. So we have a the traditional anti-Semites, if you will, the KKK and the neo-Nazis, they're a part of our uh, challenge, collective challenge. But in much broader sense, unfortunately, anti-Semitism has now become very much mainstream uh, in, uh, on the internet and many satellite television presentations mm -hmm. from Arab mm -hmm. worlds and Europe. Exactly. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the, the tools that you use to inform and to keep the public aware of the anti-Semitism anti and hate that exists throughout the world. Well, for starters, like everyone else, we're very involved in the internet. Wiesenthal.com, we have about close to 300,000 people on our e-blast list. And mm -hmm. so if we need to motivate or inform people in the public officials that there are those people who are looking after them, uh, we'll, we'll use that constituency or go to our 400,000 uh, members. But we spend a great deal of our time closely monitoring uh, how the uh, internet technologies are leveraged by hate groups and by terrorist organizations as well. Right, and we're going to talk about the internet in, uh, our, ne in our next segment. But in terms of some of the aspects of the Wiesenthal Center, when you talk about the Mariah films, um, the ability to promote uh, that mission through some very good movie making. Right, we have uh, two films, uh, Genocide was narrated by uh, the late Orson Welles and Elizabeth Taylor mm -hmm. that won an Academy Award back in 1981 and has been screened all over the world including the first Jewish documentary ever to be uh, aired, it was aired twice on Chinese television to a half a billion people. Uh, and uh, the latest, uh, The Long Way Home, which won more recently, a story about the remnants of European Jewry and their battle to find meaning between 1945 and 1948 when the State of Israel came to be. We've had five million people come through our doors in Los Angeles and as Mr. Wiesenthal's work is not just focused exclusively on Jews but on, on society generally. Very good. We'll be back with Rabbi Cooper right after these messages. We're back with Rabbi Abraham Cooper, Associate Dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Rabbi, again, thank you very much for joining us. In our first uh, segment, we talked uh, a little bit about uh, what hate is through the Internet and how those groups uh, accomplish it. And I just wanted to talk about um, some of the, the information that you showed me on uh, hate groups via the Internet is uh, incredulous. And if you could share some of that with us, please. All right, we have a project called Digital Terrorism and Hate. We've been monitoring uh, how the hate and terror groups leverage internet technologies for 13 years now. Uh, way back in 1995, there was one hate website, stormfront.org, posted by someone right here in Florida. It's still there, but we're now looking uh, way north of 14,000 uh, uh, websites, uh, blogs, and increasingly the social networking. And um, we, we really look at two areas that are sometimes related, but, all, but in many ways they're not. The hate groups, the traditional hatred that we've had to deal with, anywhere from the KKK to Holocaust denial uh, to blood libel, it's all there. All these hatreds and the conspiracy theories are incubated on the Internet. The other area, which of course we're all very worried about, are the terrorists. Uh, they're an existential threat to us all. And unfortunately, these groups uh, understand the power of the Internet and they're right there on the cutting edge. And to combat that, uh, we've, uh, the Wiesenthal Center now meets regularly with the people at Facebook. We've gone up to the Silicon Valley to see Google and YouTube and 
pretty much any of the major companies who will sit with us uh, because we need their help uh, in order for them to fully understand how uh, their technologies are being leveraged. We need them to do a better job at both the human resources and technology. Right. What's uh, so, what was so eye-opening to me is that there is nothing being massaged. Um, their, their communication is very direct in what they're trying to accomplish. Well, they'll use every technology. That means where you can do it stealthily for command and control, they know mm -hmm. how to do that. The, obviously, what we focus on primarily is the open propaganda war. And it is a war. The front line of the war against terrorism today is up on the Internet. So, for example, if we see a hate site, we're going to try to do our best to see to it that it's quickly removed, especially in social networking locations like Facebook and YouTube. Uh, when we see material that's related to terrorism, we want to make sure that the right agencies have seen it. Mm -hmm. So it's really two different approaches. It's uh, most important to know who it is who's posting that stuff. Maybe a little bit more important than taking it down a day or a week uh, early is to make sure that the people in law enforcement and, uh, and other homeland security and intelligence agencies get the information. So from a philosophical standpoint, um, you have to manage the fact of how much in for that, that information you want out there and exposed so you can expose it versus how quickly you want to take that down and uh, well, get rid it, of it. It's a very good question, but one very important thing for parents who are watching to understand is that no matter where we make our presentations, young people are never, inevitably a little bit bored. Oh, I've seen all of that. Mm -hmm. So our kids, all of our young people, they see this material, they're exposed to it, they don't necessarily know how to deal with it. Uh, it's the rest of us grown-ups who have a lot of catching up to do. And one very important uh, thing, I think, for every, every family is for the adults in the family to sit down with their teenagers and say, okay, show me the stuff, explain to me what you're seeing. You know, the spillover to bullying and uh, you know, the uh, sometimes antisocial behavior or worse. Uh, it's a very slippery slope. It doesn't dominate the Internet. We're talking about subcultures of hate and mm -hmm. of terror. And the Internet, you know, is, is neither the Messiah uh, nor the devil. The hate was there before, the uh, terrorists were there before, but all, the Internet is an unbelievable multiplier whose full power is, is still unfolding before our eyes. So how are they capturing these kids who might be, you know, very benign in terms of their feelings of hate or anti-Semitism, how does that social network grab them? Well, for one thing, it's a way of being cool. If you're talking about someone who's not ideologically driven, mm -hmm. you know you're looking at something that you shouldn't be enjoying and shouldn't be signing up and shouldn't be friending and shouldn't be Twittering. That, that's one problem. When we look at how the terrorists operate, it's a much more sophisticated operation in which they're now translating more and more of the material into English. They're not looking for marginal kids who are on the streets of uh, Pakistan. They're looking for uh, disaffected youth in Canada, Australia, UK, uh, and the United States and turn them on to what they present to them as a great religious cause, when in fact it's a manipulation of religion in, in service of terror and, and mayhem. Mm -hmm. Do you see a point in uh, our lifetimes where uh, that level of hate will diminish? I think the Internet also provides us with the opportunity to try to draw a straight line to other communities. It's not easy, uh, but one thing we know from the Jewish experience over the last 2,000 years, if we sit back and wait for someone else to take care of business for us, that's a prescription for disaster. And so in terms of uh, getting back to the mission of the Simon, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, uh, talk a little bit about the, a little bit more about how active you are in uh, getting the word out. Well, this is my life's work. I've I had the honor to know Mr. Wiesenthal nearly for 30 years. Um, you know, every day when I wake up, in addition to getting the bad news early from all over the globe and working with my great colleagues from Jerusalem to Buenos Aires, we can also impact uh, on on uh, uh, programs and on on trends and on incidents that take place. One other point I'd like to make is that in addition to all of the terrible news that we have to report, I can report to you that no matter where I've gone in the world, and I've been to Indonesia, Sudan, and a lot of places in between, there are good people all over the globe. Our 
I, I think the challenge here is to find those folks that we can work with and try to make a difference for good in the world. This is not a totally gloom and doom picture, but it is a battle between the forces of evil and the forces of good. And when we know what happened in the course of the Holocaust, the vast majority of the people were right smack in the middle, just sitting on their hands. Uh, and though that's the constituency that has to be reached and it has to be motivated. So in 30 seconds, wrap up for us how our audience can do, what the audience can do to... Uh... Well, two things. On the internet, we have a simple email address. If you see something that's wrong, send us the link to the letter I, ireport at wiesenthal.com. And if you want to know what we're doing, you want to help us with our work uh, across the United States and around the world, um, just go to wiesenthal.com, sign up for the e-blast, and uh, we'll make you part of the team. Very good. Rabbi Cooper, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. That's it for this edition. We want to thank all of our guests for appearing on the show. For all the latest news about our program, or if you have an idea for a story, please visit our website at tolifelechaim.com. I hope you'll join us next time on To Life L'chaim.